Hi friends and welcome to these final strides sessions. In these marathon revision sessions, we are going to discuss certain very important topics for your upcoming INI set exams. If you have felt you have not had enough time to revise, you know, image based questions of important topics. If you feel a little bit left out or a little bit afraid of these images that you expect to see in your exams, these sessions are perfectly designed for your quick revision. It is going to act like your last mile booster pack for the INI set exams. We are going to deal with certain very important GI tract imaging based questions in this particular short session. Remember that success won't come from some big step that you are going to take in the future. It is in fact going to be the result of small steps that you take today. These final stride sessions in just 15 to 20 minutes every day starting today, you know, we are going to revise certain important topics. The ultimate aim is to get those few say a couple of more MCQs correct in your upcoming exams. And those couple of MCQs is going to take your rank leaps and bounds ahead of your competitors. This is the aim that I have for you, my dear students. And with this aim, let us jump into the first short and crisp final stride sessions. In this session, we are going to deal with certain important conventional modality based diagnosis. Uh, GI tract imaging is an absolute favorite, you know, topic on which a lot of questions are asked in INI set exams. So we are going to discuss simple diagnosis like achalasia, cardia, zenkers, diverticulum, CA, esophagus, appendicitis, into susception. A lot of questions have been asked. Fast abdominal trauma is another absolute favorite of your examiners. Classic bowel related conditions are also something that we are going to revise. So look at this question which was asked recently in one of the uh, exams. So a patient presents with dysphagia and this image is acquired on a barium swallow image. What is the diagnosis or and rather based on the diagnosis, the question was what would be the next best investigation. Now, if you see here, basically we can see the esophagus is dilated. If you look at the distal end of the esophagus, there is a smooth elongated tapering. Remember, there is no mucosal irregularity that you see here. This narrowing is extremely smooth. It is elongated it looks like a bird's beak. So what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis, correct, the diagnosis over here is achalasia cardia. That is right. So this is the bird beak appearance. This is the bird beak appearance or sign seen in achalasia cardia. So what is the next, what is the next confirmatory investigation that is to be done in achalasia cardia? Well, though the diagnosis can be made from this particular image, that is the barium swallow, which is considered therefore as the investigation of choice, the gold standard would be to measure the actual pressure within the esophageal lumen and that is to be done with manometry. So the next thing that is to be done is an upper GI endoscopy plus along with manometry. So this was the answer to the question which was asked. So see, this is achalasia cardia, bird beak sign we have just seen. The investigation of choice for achalasia cardia can be barium swallow because the diagnosis can easily be made on barium swallow. We are able to do that here in this image as well. But the gold standard for confirmation we have just discussed is considered to be manometry. So an upper GI endoscopy is done and a manometry, the pressure is actually measured. What is the earliest and most common symptom which is found in achalasia cardia? Well, they can give you a history. The earliest and most common symptom, remember, is regurgitation, right? Regurgitation, uh, dysphagia in achalasia cardia, remember, in the early stages, it is more for liquids as compared to solids. And this one, in you know, this one small, you know, clinical pearl can help you distinguish it from CA esophagus. How to distinguish it? We'll discuss this in a few slides ahead in the next few minutes. So, achalasia is also associated with a classic triad of what did we see? We see most common symptom is regurgitation, right, along with dysphagia, right, and because there is dysphagia and regurgitation, there is going to be weight loss. So, regurgitation, dysphagia, weight loss, this is the classic triad of achalasia cardia. So, when the examiner in this exam, suppose gives you a clue of dysphagia, then the examiner can say that the dysphagia is say more for solids than liquids or the examiner can tell you that the dysphagia is more for liquids. What is the examiner trying to tell you? The examiner is trying to help you actually. You must be smart enough to pick up those clues. So dysphagia more for solids than liquids is usually a pointer towards 
CA esophagus whereas what we have just discussed here dysphagia more for liquids than solids is usually indicative of achalasia cardia also in CA esophagus it would be an elderly patient presenting with dysphagia right now look at this particular barium swallow so you can see the esophagus again right and in the esophagus in contrast to the smooth elongated narrowing that we saw in achalasia cardia what do you see here you see abrupt narrowing like a shouldering look at this irregular surface so there is mucosal irregularity which is there so this mucosal irregularity abrupt short segment narrowing involving the mid to distal portion of the esophagus suggests that there is a mass along the esophageal wall the surface of the mass is irregular there is mucosal irregularity and therefore you see this irregular narrowing so this is suggestive of the rat tail appearance of ca esophagus remember bird beak sign achalasia cardia rat tail appearance ca esophagus the overall investigation of choice for ca esophagus is considered to be endoscopy along with a biopsy of the mass which will be seen so this is considered to be the overall investigation of choice imaging investigation of choice to look for distant spread is going to be a PET CT whereas imaging investigation of choice specifically if the examiner is asking you for TN staging then it is going to be endoscopic ultrasound so these are the various investigation based questions you could be asked as far as ca esophagus is concerned right okay now see another question see again a barium swallow image and you see a projection arising from the esophagus towards the vertebral column so it is more posterior or posterior lateral patient presents with what patient is presenting with a neck swelling regurgitation and there is a gurgling sound when pressed over the neck because there is a diverticulum with stasis of contents within it a barium swallow is done so whenever you see a posteriorly you know direct di you know directed diverticulum arising from the esophagus it is always going to be zenker's diverticulum remember the most common complication associated with zenker's diverticulum is going to be aspiration pneumonitis so aspiration that is because of the static contents within these anchors when the patient is in a supine position patient is asleep it is going to get aspirated causing aspiration pneumonia so this is about zenker's diverticulum look at this esophagus now can you see this classic patient presence with retrosternal pain you see a corkscrew esophagus right this is seen in a condition called as yes diffuse esophageal spasm so this is corkscrew esophagus rosary bead esophagus curling's esophagus seen in diffuse esophageal spasm now there is another condition which is a differential condition of diffuse esophageal spasm that is called as nut crackers esophagus it is also a painful condition because of uh, uh, incoordinated contractions of the esophageal muscle wall right how to distinguish between them well diffuse esophageal spasm on barium swallow presents with this corkscrew appearance right but in nutcrackers esophagus the barium swallow study barium swallow study if it is done it is absolutely normal and therefore the diagnosis of nutcrackers esophagus is based solely on manometry that is the actual measurement of the intraluminal pressure within the esophageal lumen that is how you distinguish between diffuse esophageal spasm and nutcrackers esophagus now sometimes patient you know on the barium swallow study reveals these small horizontal lines you know on the along the esophageal lumen this is what is called as esophageal shiver or feline esophagus this is associated due to contraction of the muscularis mucosae muscularis mucosae layer contraction of that results in undermining of the mucosa very importantly you could be asked it is associated with what so it is associated with basically reflux esophagitis reflux esophagitis it is associated with hiatus hernia it is also associated with eosinophilic eosinophilic esophagitis so reflux esophagitis hiatus hernia eosinophilic esophagitis you know these are the associations of feline esophagus or esophageal shiver that now your examiner may 
give you a clinical scenario and ask you to distinguish between a benign gastric ulcer and a malignant gastric ulcer. What is a benign gastric ulcer? So, benign gastric ulcer basically is a peptic ulcer. The peculiarity of a benign gastric ulcer is if you see this is the lesser curvature of the stomach, a benign gastric ulcer always projects out of the gastric lumen. If you see a collection of barium projecting out of the gastric lumen, it is usually a benign gastric ulcer. Moreover, at the mouth of the ulcer, you can sometimes see a lucent band. This is called called as the Hampton's line. This is called as the Hampton's line. So, if you see an ulcer projecting out of the lumen, right, along with the Hampton's line at its mouth, it is what is called as a benign gastric ulcer. Whereas, a malignant gastric ulcer is what? A malignant gastric ulcer is after all a tumor or a mass which is projecting in the gastric lumen. So, it does not project out. So, you see a collection of barium right it is not projecting out of the lumen see it is in the lumen right it has a convex contour towards the lumen this convex contour is after all nothing but the tumor surface so this is what is called as the carmen's meniscus and because there is a tumor there is mucosal edema around it right and therefore you see that halo black halo around it this is what is called as the kirklin complex so quickly to revise an ulcer projecting out of the gastric lumen with a Hampton's line is benign gastric ulcer whereas an ulcer projecting into the gastric lumen with a convexity towards the lumen that is Carmen's meniscus and a halo around it that is a Kirkland complex this is what suggests a malignant gastric ulcer. Now if a child presents to you with vomiting and the child presents immediately at birth with bilious vomiting then it would mean that some part of the bowel has not developed congenitally and therefore the presentation is when it is immediately at birth. Bilious vomiting means that some part distal to the opening of the biliary tree is atritic and therefore the bile biliary secretions are coming out through vomiting, bilious vomiting is there. So this is usually suggestive of, yes, this is suggestive of duodenal atresia so these are clinical pearls clinical insights that we are discussing history will give you give rise to the diagnosis we are also going to discuss what are going to be the imaging findings in these conditions quickly whereas if the examiner tells you that the child presents with vomiting but the child does not present immediately at birth the child presents at 6 to 12 weeks of age and the child presents with non bilious vomiting then it cannot be duodenal atresia then it is usually yes it is usually pyloric stenosis it is usually pyloric stenosis yes now let us quickly look at this look at this child presenting that is a neonate presenting at birth with bilious vomiting we discussed this could be duodenal atresia so what do you see in duodenal atresia you see two bubbles this is the first bubble that is the stomach this is the second bubble that is the proximal duodenum so you see a double bubble sign this is what is called as the double bubble sign of duodenal atresia Right now, a single bubble sign conventionally has been described in a case of pyloric stenosis, the single bubble being the overdistended stomach. A double bubble sign we have seen here is duodenal atresia, whereas a triple bubble sign has been described conventionally in jejunal atresia. Right? So, these are the various bubble signs that I want you to know along with this clinical profile. Now see a child presents with vomiting when not at birth but at 6 to 12, 12 weeks of age and with non bilious vomiting on a barium swallow study you see an over distended stomach and a narrowing at the level of the pyloric canal as you can see here then this is what is called as pyloric stenosis initially it was called congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis but we've just seen it is not congenital it takes a few weeks after birth right to present to happen and present so it is now called as infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis though it can be diagnosed very well on barium meal study that you can see here what is the investigation of choice the investigation of choice is usually usg because no radiation exposure is involved the pylorus is superficial can be readily seen the thickness of the pyloric muscle layer of more than 4 to 5 mm elongation or the length of the pyloric canal being more than 16 to 18 mm suggest that there is pyloric hypertrophy which is there. Various imaging signs have been described on a barium meal study. See this is where the hypertrophic muscle is right. So the stomach is trying to push the contents beyond that hypertrophic pyloric canal. So this hyperperistalsis of the stomach 
gives rise to a caterpillar like appearance of the stomach the sudden uh, you know hypertrophy of the pyloric muscle gives rise to an impression of the stomach lumen this is what is called as the shoulder sign of pyloric stenosis the thin string like canal of the pyloric canal is called as the string sign sometimes there is undermining of the mucosa this gives rise to double tract sign the impression on the duodenal bulb so the duodenal bulb looks like a mushroom this is what is called as the mushroom sign these are all signs which have been described in pyloric stenosis now we come to fast what is fast it is focused assessment with sonography in trauma right if a patient comes to you with history of abdominal trauma first step that is to be done is what first step to be done is fast so if fast is positive when is fast positive when you see free fluid within the peritoneal cavity if you see free fluid within the peritoneal cavity it suggests that there is hemoperitoneum very likely due to some solid organ injury the next step will de depend upon the patient's hemodynamic status if the patient is hemodynamically stable you have time at hand so the next investigation you should do is the modality of choice for solid organ injury what is that it is contrast enhanced ct whereas if the patient is hemodynamically unstable you do not have time to do a ct scan patient may go into a state of hypotension shock and may die so therefore you must do an emergency exploratory laparotomy try to identify where the site of injury is try to arrest the bleed that is how you can save the life of this patient so this is the protocol to be followed in case of abdominal trauma why is ultrasound used in fast is because fluid is friend of ultrasound air is enemy of ultrasound what are we trying to detect in the abdominal cavity peritoneal cavity is fluid that is blood right so wherever in the body you want to detect fluid remember fluid is friend of ultrasound so you should use ultrasound so therefore fast is used therefore ultrasound is used in this particular case to detect intraperitoneal free fluid remember fast is a you know a part of pocus what is pocus pocus is nothing but point of care ultrasound so what is point of care ultrasound right it does not mean that the patient has to travel to the radiology department to get a fast done right because it is a part of point of care ultrasound so these ultrasound equipments are kept within the emergency room or the casualty itself as soon as the patient is brought to the hospital immediately a probe can be kept on the abdomen just to see whether there is free fluid or not so this is what is called as point of care ultrasound what is the standard fast protocol these four views are obtained so the first view is usually sub xephoid view longitudinal right upper quadrant longitudinal left upper quadrant and then there is a supra pubic view the first view which is usually always obtained is sub xephoid so this is the first view which is usually obtained if your examiner asks you what is the overall best view or most sensitive view to detect hemoperitoneum then it is usually the right upper quadrant so this is the most sensitive most sensitive view to detect minimal hemoperitoneum because we are able to visualize the morrison's pouch hepatorenal pouch in the right upper quadrant view this is one of the most dependent parts of the peritoneal cavity where blood is going to accumulate so th therefore this is the most sensitive what is e fast e fast is extended fast so in this we in we extend the examination of fast to the thorax so we evaluate the anterior thorax right so anterior thorax to rule out pneumo thorax and we also evaluate the posterior dependent thorax to rule out hemothorax right so pneumothorax and hemothorax both can be uh, you know assessed by using the extended fast protocol so most commonly used probe for usg probe for fast is a convex probe or a curvy linear probe and this has a frequency of usually 2 to 5 megahertz this is the most common probe which is used first quadrant we have seen which is scanned in fast is sub xephoid quadrant most sensitive quadrant quadrant with most maximum sensitive for hemoperitoneum is usually the right upper quadrant this is something that we have already discussed yes so see usg or e fast is least useful in so it can be used for pericardial effusion when we use it for in the sub xephoid view pneumothorax in extended fast yes 
renal injury retroperitoneal hematoma both are retroperitoneal structures kidneys can very well be seen in the right upper quadrant right and therefore if there is a renal laceration or a contusion it can be very well seen remember usg is least sensitive for detection of retroperitoneal abnormalities retroperitoneal structures are obscured by the bowel loops in the peritoneal cavity right and air is within those bowel loops air is enemy of ultrasound so for most of the retroperitoneal structures like pancreas retroperitoneal hematomas ultrasound usually does not work and therefore in this case the answer is retroperitoneal hematoma this is the least useful this is the condition in which ultrasound is going to be least useful right now usually a child presents to you with severe pain in the lower abdomen sometimes there could be fever or tachycardia that is because of the infection or the pain and there is typically tenderness at the mcburney's point so tenderness at mcburney's point this is the history clincher of acute appendicitis if your examiner asks you what is the investigation of choice for acute appendicitis in children remember it is ultrasound a uh, child's abdomen size is smaller usg has a better probability to visualize the inflamed appendix this is not the case in adults so investigation of choice in adults is usually a contrast enhanced ct scan the same is true for intussusception as well investigation of choice for intussusception in children is ultrasound in adults it is contrast and on ct on ultrasound usually you see a blind ended tubular structure in the right iliac fossa with surrounding fluid surrounding signs of inflammation probe tenderness when we pre press with the ultrasound probe there so this is what will give you a diagnosis of acute appendicitis on ct again right we can see an inflamed appendix with periappendiceal fat stranding and edematous cecal tissue just adjacent to the appendix is what is called as the cecal bar sign sometimes the positive contrast within the cecum takes a shape of an arrowhead which points towards the inflamed appendix this is what is called as the arrowhead sign so cecal bar sign arrowhead signs are signs of acute appendicitis that have been described another short you know peculiar clinical situation see two year old boy is brought to the hospital by his mother after he was terrified seeing what seeing significant fresh red blood in stool so blood in stools in a child remember two possibilities into susception or meckel's diverticulum right in this case the boy is comfortable pulse is all right bp is all right no fever pain or vomiting soft abdomen good peristalsis what scan is done usg was normal a technetium labeled per technet scan this scan this per technet agent has a property to go and get localized to gastric mucosa so therefore you can see in this image a lot of uptake in the stomach but can you see an uptake over here this is the urinary bladder right it is excreted through the urinary bladder this is the stomach but what is this this is an uptake in the meckel's diverticulum right why does meckel's diverticulum bleed because inside meckel's diverticulum there is ectopic gastric mucosa ectopic gastric mucosa and because this there is ectopic gastric mucosa it is going to secrete acid it will cause erosions of the small bowel mucosa and therefore there is always gi bleeding right in meckel's diverticulitis this per technate agent is going to get localized to this ectopic gastric mucosa and therefore this is called meckel's scan or technetium 99m per technate scan which is considered the investigation of choice for meckel's diverticulum and therefore in this case the answer was meckel's diverticulum so remember a child with pain in abdomen blood in stools and a technetium labeled per technate scan or a meckel scan is suggestive of the presence of a meckel's diverticulum remember friends quitters will never win and winners will never quit right the pressure that you feel at this last few days towards your exam in this la final countdown is quite high the anxiety levels are high but all i want you to know is that you should never give up keep trying keep working hard till the last day till the time of the exam give your best shot and i'm sure you will definitely win let us get through this together all the best